and other SNCC members began a voter drive in Lowndes County, Alabama, known as Bloody Lowndes for its violence against blacks. Although 80% of the population was black, there were no black elected officials. Economically dependent on white plantation owners, many were afraid to join civil rights efforts, and none had been allowed to register to vote until early 1965. Now in this country it says majority rules. We are 80% of the majority in this, we are 80% in this county. And we have the right to rule this county. We have the right to rule this county and we're going to rule it. Next up, has your clock been ticking for change? You did your bit, you cast your vote, and now you're wondering why everything hasn't changed for the better already? Well, next up, one of those stories that sets the impatient among us straight. Ohio State professor Hassan Kwame Jeffries tells the for the first time, the remarkable story of one county, Lowndes County, Alabama, where he traces the roots of that 1960s movement and Stokely Carmichael and Black is Beautiful and all the rest right back to post-Civil War years of Reconstruction and the aftermath. The book is Bloody Lounds, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt. And I, I just loved it. I'll just start by saying that it was a great read and Thank a you. beautiful piece of history. And I think a really salutary story, particularly for organizers who you put front and center in this book. Tell us just first off, why Lounds and why that approach? Well, what happened in Lowndes was really a remarkable story. I mean, this is a county that in 1965, as we saw from the clip, at the beginning of 1965 had zero registered voters, zero registered African-American voters in a county that's 80% African-American. But over the course of a year and a half, not only did they succeed through this grassroots organizing movement of registering a majority of African-Americans after the Voting Rights Act, leading up to an after the Voting Rights Act of 65, but they succeeded in creating this radically democratic, independent political party that brushed against uh, the normal or usual undemocratic traditions of American politics. So I was drawn to this particular county because I wanted to discover what it was that led these folk, uh, rural, everyday, ordinary folk, to not only succeed in registering to vote, but to create this radically democratic, independent Well, we'll get party. into just what was so radical about it in a second, but one of the typical stories that we get, particularly, I think, brought to us by the North-based media, is that the civil rights movement, A, kind of sprouted in a year somewhere in the end of the 50s, and B, was really largely thanks to outsiders who came and helped out uh, in the South with the Freedom Rides and all the rest in 1964. You, A, expand the historical narrative, and you deepen it. How? When do you think it starts? Well, the roots of it really go back, as you, as you mentioned in the introduction, I mean, to the daybreak of freedom. Uh, I mean, you have to look at the struggle for uh, not only civil rights, but also human rights by African Americans as not being something that began, as you mentioned, in the 50s or in the 60s. But the roots of that go back to the moment of emancipation. Enslaved African Americans at the daybreak of freedom look back at their experiences in slavery and come up with the conceptualization of what freedom ought to be. And they define that in terms of those civil rights and human rights that have been denied them. So over the course of the next century, they are engaged in this prolonged struggle to secure those basic rights. Now you're talking freedom, that's different from civil rights, different language. It is, and I think we often lump all of African American activism under, under the umbrella of civil rights. And certainly there were civil rights goals and objectives, African Americans fighting for those rights that were guaranteed by the government. But I actually refer to it as a freedom rights struggle because not only were African Americans fighting for civil rights, but they were also fighting for human rights, which they were also denied. And freedom had been the, the, the rallying cry of that moment, post-slavery. You've got to describe for our audience how you open one of your chapters early in the book. It's right after the end of the Civil War, or a little while after. And the people of Lowndes hear that there's going to be something given back to them. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's shortly after, or in the midst of Reconstruction, uh, and a rumor begins to swirl in the county, in one section of the county, that the government is going to send an agent into Lowndes County uh, and engage in the process of land redistribution. 
I mean, one of the things that African Americans defined as a core element of freedom was owning land. This is a rural society. They understood that land was critical. And they didn't want just any land. They wanted the land that they had worked and given their lives for as enslaved persons. And they'd been led to expect it. Absolutely. And they, and they thought that the government would come in on their side, the government of freedom, the government that fought for, uh, their, you know, for their freedom to end slavery. So and they show up right there at the railway station. Absolutely. They drop their farm implements and they, they come to the railroad station. And unfortunately, it's just a rumor. Uh, but they don't give up hope. I mean, they, they, they then say, well, there must have just been a miscommunication of some sort. And so they come back a few days later. And again, it's just a rumor. And so that disappointment uh, is there, but they never lose hope. And they continue to fight for uh, not only land ownership, but also economic independence, mm. a daily wage later on with sharecroppers and the like. You um, trace the stories of, of a few people, because you also talk about how the population moves, but they retain their relationships. Tell us about um, John Hewlett, for example. Uh, John Hewlett uh, is one of the central figures, not only in the book, uh, but really in the Lowndes movement. Here was a person who was born and raised in Lowndes County, uh, graduates from high school uh, in the mid-1940s at a time when the average education in Lowndes County was only the sixth grade. He goes up to Birmingham, uh, uh, moves to Birmingham, works in the steel mills, and then and there becomes active in civil rights organizing. Not a frontline activist, but active in it. And then he returns to the county in the late 50s. Active in the steel mills and union organizing? Active in the steel mills and in the in union organizing there, but more importantly, active in the NAACP. Mm -hmm and then his successor when the NAACP is banned by the state. But he takes those experiences and comes back to Lowndes County. And over the course of a few years, is trying to get people interested to conquer their fear. Uh, they call Bloody Lowndes, Bloody Lowndes because it was so violent, uh, to conquer their fear. And he finally succeeds in getting a handful of people to come down with him in 1965 to attempt to register to vote, even though they all know they're gonna be turned away. Uh, and so he's at the center of the making of the movement, and really it doesn't happen without him. Mm. 